Welcome to another episode of The Local Dive. This is Alex Scott, joined by Ashlyn Portero and Dean and Sarah. How we doing? Hey, everybody. Good. Glad to be here. Good. We're excited to... Ooh, there was a long fizz on that one. Um, we're excited to jump into a, another episode of The Local Dive as we uh, finish out in our deep dive, uh, the, the sort of three-week mini-series, I guess, we've had, uh, where we've been talking through uh, the the topics of a recent sermon series, Dean, that you preached through called Clarity, where we looked at uh, connecting, equipping, and uh, today we'll be talking about sending and what it means to, to live, you know, sent as Christians, and then also how do we, in our churches, develop a culture of sending. Um, but before we do, we will wade into the shallow end. And uh, we were talking as we were preparing for this episode about uh, things we wish we could have gone to or could have been a part of. And so... Uh, curious to hear from you guys in the shallow end. What is one event or thing that in your lifetime you didn't go to that you wish you could have been a part of? Well, since he's three years older than me, I can't say Tom Brady's birth. That was my. <laughs> oh that was going to be gosh. mine. But due to the rules of the that, game, that's so creepy. I want to so respect. I want to so respect weird. the uh, the integrity of the game. So thank, thank you. It was not in my lifetime. I um. And then my other one, not in my lifetime, would have been Carlton Fisk's home run against the Reds okay. in the 75 World Series in yeah. Game 6. Even though the Red Sox lost the series, <laughs> it's still what everybody remembers is yeah. that. Uh, but in my lifetime, I'd been there when Reagan gave his speech at the Berlin Wall. Ooh. Just that would have been. Good. And I hope to go to Berlin one day, speaking of sent to visit our missionaries there. Yeah. And that spot, I'd like to actually go. I know the wall's down, but I'd like to actually go visit it. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Um, well, we, since we were talking about the Olympics earlier today, uh, I would go back to the 1996 Olympics when Carrie Strug did her incredible vault on a broken ankle. I would have loved to have like physically been there because that is like my, so my family is like my sister was a gymnast for a long time. And so I, I grew up going to like gymnastics meets and stuff like that. And so we were obsessed with watching the like gymnastics and the Olympics and, and pretty much all like elite competitions. And so that's, you know, even more so than just being like a girl, you know, like a younger girl in the nineties. And like, that was just a cool moment. Like for America, that also was just like, I have, I feel like I have extra like commitment to that. So it, I would it, have loved to have been there. It was incredible. I mean, it really was yeah. a, I know you're a Saturday Night Live fan. Chris Catan's Carrie Scrub scru- oh, was yes. just unbelievable. <laughs> Random fact, Chrissy, my wife Chrissy, she went to bed like 10 minutes before Carrie oh, landed. No. She's like, I'm just going to go to bed. I'm tired. I don't think we're going to win. All this kind of, And then she, the next Nailed morning, it. found out like one of the greatest oh, moments. My gosh. Outside of us being the Russians in hockey, yeah. <laughs> by the greatest moment of American I get you know, chills history. Just yeah, it was unbelievable. Magnificent Seven, shout out to, to them. I, I, I think the I can name oh, some of them I was going to say, can which... Y'all? I think I could name all of them. No. Right. I, oh, go. Okay, let's try this. Dominic Dawes, Dominic Musciano, J.C. Phelps, Carrie Strug. Oh man, um, who are who am I missing? Sh- oh, um, she has blonde hair. Shannon Miller. Miller, thank you. Um, oh man. Alex, are you looking it up? Yes, I am. I am. That Googling. was pretty good, though. Um, getting getting J.C. Phelps, especially that was a tough one. I, yeah. Um, did you say Carrie? Did you yeah, include I said, her? Okay. I think so. Okay. Do- both Dominiques, Carrie, Shannon, uh, J.C. JC Phelps. <laughs> who I just named. Yeah. Two we have more. two more. Was yeah, one they, Kim? I think Kim's Mescal was gone by then. Well, yeah, wasn't she? she might have been like a a coach even by then or something so the, the, i liked her when i was kid oh man are we ready to are give, we ready to give us like a give me the name the first they, letter they both start with a Ooh. their first names both start with a ally something nope no that's now that's our girl our most recent person oh my gosh i'm gonna like this is gonna i'm just were they, al- the were they the alternates day. uh no, no there they was competed the magnific- magnific- amanda one of them is amanda amanda, who, amanda. I'm just totally. I'm There's totally a milk blanking. company that has a cow that has the same name as her last name, what? Amanda Borden. <laughs> oh, she had the short blonde hair. Yes, Amanda Borden. I totally remember her. And then, and then who was the other one? Amy Chow. Amy Chow. Okay, I yeah. I would not have gotten that. I can totally yeah. see all of them. Yes. I Dang. would have gotten Carrie Strug because you said it, and no one else. <laughs> now I will say Dominic Luciano. <laughs> okay, she's I like kn- American icon. At the I know, time. I know, I knew <laughs> them. So when you said them, I was like, oh yes, I remember, I remember. But I am gonna go back I, and like 
So, sorry, gym, gymnastics wasn't my thing. It was every you got a you communist <laughs> take you to East Berlin. I can picture their jackets. Like Carrie, she like just had her it was jacket. A, wasn't and her it wasn't like a big flag. On. Yes, yeah. with like the stars on it. Yeah, and then yeah. obviously Ooh. her ankle was all and Bella carrying her. Uh, it was just it was a whole thing. Okay, can, can I'm, I'm gonna get emotional? Can we get can, okay? This is, th- too much. this is okay. This might be a little too personal, and so if like we lose all of our listeners after this, I'm sorry. <laughs> but okay, in '96, I was really into the Olympics, and my birthday they followed shortly thereafter uh-huh. and I don't know why but I was really into swimming at the <laughs> at that time I, I didn't swim competitively I just like got Olympic fever around oh, swimming yeah. and so for my birthday we went to Boca where my great aunt and uncle lived and somehow ended up in the, this is so embarrassing in the speedo store in a mall in in Boca and so you're like I'm buying one so so I bought an American flag speedo as an eight year old oh my, my. Gosh. have you worn it <laughs> not since I was eight <laughs> Um, but th- that th- Scott, your mother, actually, she probably loved every minute. Oh, of it. it's she like does people for who sure. wear American flag speedos, <laughs> like Europeans, like dads who like don't care and want to embarrass people, and eight year old Alex. Yes, yes. Old Alex. <laughs> an American flag yeah. one. It's like now, hold on, it's like it gets, scandalous. It gets better. It gets better. So yeah, I, I left like, out all the like ill res- <laughs> of ill repute roles. Yeah, who, who might I, wear that. I spent I spent literally all weekend in my grand aunt and uncle's pool in this speedo. <laughs> And Pat I, Scott, we I, want pictures. I'm no pictures. No, we do not. <laughs> I do. There, there is picture somewhere. Pat can find it. But I got American flag tan lines on my butt. <laughs> <laughs> it it like the, the speedo tan. I'm this telling you, not level. making it up. So sorry. Like wow. I said, everybody's no longer listening. Nobody cares what wow. I missed. But yeah, that was. That's my that's that's where my Ooh. mind was in '96. So well, I think from uh, a couple episodes back, I had said if I was going to get any tattoo, it would be because I was an Olympic athlete and I got the Olympic rings tattooed on me. So like, I Olympic fever is like not every four years for me. I I carry the torch <laughs> inside myself always. So <laughs> do you, do you great, think, great way to say that. Do you think Robert <laughs> Jeffress has an American flag speedo? Oh my gosh, Sorry. we're not going there. Fair question. Um, yeah, I'm gonna leave that one alone. I need to go um, think about the higher things now. Um, Set my mind on things. So, about. what was your? Yeah, thing? I was gonna say. So, mine is. Uh, this is super random, but grew up a, and still am a huge Detroit Red Wings fan. And um, in the 2002 Stanley Cup Finals, they they beat the the um, Hurricanes and uh, Car- like from Carolina. And um, there was a game three. It went to triple overtime, and I think. I want to say Igor Larionov scored the game-winning goal 55 minutes into overtime. Wow. So it was basically two full games, and I was in a hotel in, like, I th- it, we were driving either to or from, I don't remember which, uh, to Detroit, um, and I was in a hotel in, like, Kentucky or Tennessee, and I stayed up until, I don't know, 1 in the morning to, to watch. That's awesome. And just to be there, like, it would have been, it would have been amazing. So um, anti-USA gymnastics pro hockey I mean, like you're straight out of the Kremlin, man. Yeah, hey, <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah and I, I, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I do have a Red Wing shirt that replaced the wheel with the sickle and hammer um, for for the Russian five line that played in '95. I so, knew it, oh called gosh. it. You know, so you, you're knocking down the Berlin Wall. I'm asking for like, you know, Soviet Russia to come back. <laughs> apparently, um, I'm just over here weeping so. on the, on the Olympics. It could be like a track person that I've never heard of before, and it is like you can ask my friends. I just it's. It's next level. It's so pretty sad. That, that'll be my answer. <laughs> you know, the, a, a very close second would be when um, George W. Bush threw out the first pitch oh, after that's 9-11. Oh, a good one. To be in that stadium would have been incredible. I mean, is there a bigger middle finger to the world than when he threw that dart across? That's incredible. I mean, I, I still, like, watch it, like, yeah. for fun. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, and since we revealed today how God and country Ashland has, she'd have loved to have been there. <laughs> oh, too. my gosh. I'm not the one who had a Speedo. Thank you. So. Yeah, I'm glad it's past tense. <laughs> I had a Speedo. Pictures, Pat. Pictures. <laughs> I take it back. I would like to go back in time before this conversation happened. That's what I, I'd want to go back to that. And, and, Mom, please don't post those on the internet. Um <laughs> Because <laughs> when it's on the internet, it's forever. Anyways, Ooh, um, moving on. Yeah, I was gonna say now to transition into much more serious matters. <laughs> Dean, uh, you know, as we yes, as we, we need <laughs> missions in our own lives. Yes. Yes. Uh, Send somebody, to us. Somebody come evangelize us. Um, can you set up uh, the the kind of where we went in the last week? 
of clarity as you talked about the, the component of sending and the responsibility that is of, of the church and of Christians to, to live sent lives. Yeah, well, we don't just want to reach people and connect people and equip people, you know, just for the sake of it. Now, granted, to connect people to Christ, we want to do that because of what that means. It's everything, right? Uh, but we want to not just equip them so they can have more knowledge. We want to equip them so, one, their affections grow for God, and they really want to participate in life with God. But also that knowledge and that theology increases their even more awareness and urgency for the need for the gospel to go. So for us, it's like a critical component of the church is the idea of we're not just equipped, we're also sent. So Jesus, I mean, the Great Commission, this is the mission of the church. This is what we do. This is what is uniquely ours, you know, as, as local churches, like the Great Commission to go and send people to the ends of the earth, but also for people to see that it's also when they go to work and their neighbor and their family, like we're all like sent. My friend Jason Dukes wrote a, wrote a book called, um, like, called Sent, like you are a letter. Mm. Like God wants to take the good news of the gospel through you. Your faith comes by hearing, Romans 10 says. How beautiful the feet of those who bring good news. How can people know unless they hear? And sending is what churches do. So we want to make that a big push of what we're really about here. Ashlyn, can you talk a little bit uh, about, and Dean, thank you for kind of setting that up. Can you talk about the role of sending the church and sending globally and how we should be thinking about, so, you know, you know, Dean, you just kind of mentioned like the ends of the earth and in in some ways right like in america we are the ends of the earth you know acts one says judea samaria and to all the earth to the ends of the earth like america would have been included in the no to doubt. the ends of the <laughs> earth. absolutely and yeah, so 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 god's mission is moving forward it has moved you know because of people who have faithfully carried it um, but ashley can you maybe talk a little bit about just the role of the church in continuing to take it to the ends of the earth yeah, I mean, I, I think there are people all over the world who have never heard the name of Jesus. And so um, we, you know, we want to see, I mean, God says that, you know, every tribe, tongue, and nation will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so um, we, we want to be a part of that. Like that, that's what we have, you know, and, and our model is, is Christ. I mean, God sent his son. And so now we want to send people to tell them about him, <laughs> that, that he has come for us. And so um, I think that... Uh, the church, while of course, as Dean said, we want to equip people to live on mission here, and it has to start, you, you know, all of your life is is really just sort of this um, uh, continuing to, to try to orient your life outward toward others, and so it has to start at home. You know, we want to have relationships with, with relationships with people near us to tell them about Jesus, um, but we also recognize that there's people all across the world who have no access. You know, I mean, here in Tallahassee, um, praise the Lord. We have many great gospel churches here in our city. People have access to the word of God um, in, in, you know, whether it's the, the written word or coming to a church to hear like they have um, y- you can find people, you know, if you if you want to. But and of course, we, you know, we, we don't ever want to take for granted that somebody doesn't know about Jesus. But um, in in especially in the American South, it is more of a, a given that they have at least heard something. So there are people, you know, all over the world who who have no idea. And so. Um, we, you know, we, we want to send people who are going to go to those places. And so I think the church can really, uh, start by casting that vision for people, um, in in their church and letting them know, Hey, even if you yourself, um, if if the Lord at this point in time has not called you to go somewhere else, uh, you are still called to, to care for that. Like that's, that's, um, a, a calling and a commission that is for every Christian. And so even just, um, educating our own people about what, uh, I mean, all that goes into global missions, but inviting people to pray um, is huge. And then talking about why we uh, financially support, you know, works across the world and support missionaries and all of those things. Um, really just, the ch- I think the church has a responsibility to help people figure out how they are going to be a part of uh, you know, reaching the world with the gospel. And, and that doesn't necessarily mean like for each individual person, you know, what, what works for you, but kind of saying here is how as Christians um, in, in the location that we are and with the means that we have, here is how we approach gospel missions. And so inviting people to come along with that. Yeah. What are, and I think that was really, really well said, you know, and, and even, I mean, I love the, the encouragement that some people may not go, 
but they can be praying for people who are going. They can be praying for people who have already gone, praying that, you know, maybe there's there's support roles and things that they can do in the local church to help see people sent. Um, Dean, one of the things that you've modeled really well for us as a church since the very beginning, and I think are passionate about, is to see people live sent lives in Tallahassee, to see, you know, and that We've, we've kind of said that mission starts here, so sending starts here, and that's when you were talking about that, like it has to be at home there. Even though there's access to the gospel here, we don't take that for granted. How, Dean, you know, maybe speak to two people, the church leader that wants to create a culture of sending in their church, what are some, some quick steps that they can, to, you know, and, and not that it's quick, but what are some things they can do to help encourage and challenge people in that context? And then maybe for um, people who are in Tallahassee as the second part, what are the the things that you would encourage them to do to live sent lives? Well, I think church-wise, I think first you have to see it as a lifestyle more than a category, while at the same time understanding there is an actual international global component and category that you must have. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's both and. Uh, but really, your church is not. I don't think a church is going to care about the nations outside of an occasional, you know, offering, uh, unless they're caring about lostness here in their own community and in their own home. Uh, so I, I think that lostness just has to bother us. I think we have to get to the point where we really do believe our own theology about people that are going to stand before God based on their own works and their own merit, and the fact they're going to be punished for their sins. But uh, we're minimizing God's message of His love if we're not acting on that reality. So. I think it's a culture shift change first and foremost in a church about the lifestyle side of things. That Everyone in this church is a missionary. Everyone who calls is a member of our church is a missionary. Now there's people who are being missionaries in different contexts and giving their full-time lives to it vocationally. And I want to make sure we understand that's a different thing. But at the same time, every Christian mindset-wise should see themselves as an ambassador for Christ, Mm -hmm. which is not just somebody who lives a Christian lifestyle or example, but actually a representation of the good news from God to where they live. And so I I think you just have to work hard to to make that a reality in your life, that your family is really intentional about trying to find ways, you as a person, whoever it might be, are trying to find ways to be around lost people, just to have relationships. And it can be one at a time. Mm -hmm. You know, I love the who's your one. You know, one person, it can be be hard to find 15 people. We're not asking for that. Find one, you know, one person in your life you just stay connected to, you have a chance to have real conversations with, share the gospel with, but then also that every Christian also sees that they're not exempt from maybe the call of the global mission. Mm. That blank check David Platt talks about where he says, God, here, here it is. Here's my life. Cash it as you wish. To where it might even, not, might even make sense to you to go at this season in your life, but that you would at least walk with your church and say out loud to somebody, hey, I think that could be me. I think I could go. You know, even for two years, mm. I, I could go full time somewhere. So I think that just has to be, I think we have to see missions as beyond just something we pray for, and so, which is critical, and something we give to, which is also critical, but something that involves us also. And I think that's the game changer when we see that there's there aren't exemptions for anyone in the church to be sent every single day. And more people, I think, can go around across the world, can go to another city that needs church plants and that they can go help with than people realize. I think it is for more people. Yeah, I I think that's one of the things as you were talking that comes to mind is we've had, you know, all three of us have had the opportunity to attend sending ceremonies either, you know, as part of the convention or in Richmond and, um, you know, through the IMB where, you know, there's, I don't know, 20, 30, 60, 70, you know, whatever, depending on the ceremony, like people who are standing up there to say, you know, I'm, you know, so and so, and this is my this is my family, or, or or I'm a single individual who's going, and they're going literally all across the world. And I think when I first just had this thought of global missions, it it, it I lended it more to myself as like that's something that you get into when you're really young, and then like maybe you're a career missionary, but like there's people who are 40, 50, 60, you know, who have retired from some vocation, and then they've said I don't want the rest of my life to be you know, wasted to, to, to steal a phrase from John Piper, like, uh, you know, they're not picking up seashells on, on the beach. Not that that's inherently sinful. Um, but they are using their lives to go. And so that 
totally reframed that for me what it means for somebody who can go full time to, to to the mission field um, that anybody can can take at any point in their life can say here's my life lord use it as you would um and at dean and ashlyn on this is there anything that you would say and obviously we're you know we're, we're by the lord's grace we've been able to send you know three three couples full time to the mission field we're praying for more um, you know, Ashlyn, you've led a lot of great kind of uh, initiatives to help care for them and keep the church connected to them. What are some things on the church side that that leaders can do to, um, you know, because Dean, you talked about it, like outside of a outside of an offering, you know, m- maybe global missions is never on people's minds. Um, what are some things that people can do in the church space to help just? raise awareness to 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 use a you know favorite phrase of the day to 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 really create that culture where sending is normal and people mm-hmm. are thinking about it um i mean i definitely think awareness plays a huge part in it and so talking about it you know we and and of course I want to preface this by saying like we can always do a better a better job and there's many ways that we um can and are thinking you know think about uh how how to do a better job of this but you know, we, we really try to incorporate our missionaries into our services on Sundays, whether that's through an update video or um, where it's appropriate, you know, asking them to lead a scripture reading or a prayer um, or, you know, things like that, keeping them involved and, and um, quote unquote, in front of people <laughs> through technology, uh, you know, unless they can physically be here and then um, through other means of communication So I do think that awareness is important. Um, There are so many great resources. I mean, we're a Southern Baptist church, and so through the IMB, the International Mission Board, I mean, the amount of resources that they create for churches that we, you know, otherwise would have to spend so much time and money creating and probably couldn't do as good of a job, not because we don't have talented people, but because um, we're not living in this day to day. We, you know, all of the research that goes into sharing information about um, unreached people groups and, and things like that. Um, There are so many resources, and so I think taking advantage of what is available to you to educate people. uh, We do, you know, we participate in the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, which supports international missionaries through the IMB every year. We we make that a thing. So we're putting um, specific things like that in front of people where they're learning and they're seeing. But I also think that hands-on approach, and when I say hands-on, that's either involving people in um, prayer efforts for your missionaries or that care piece of saying, hey, you know, um, our, our kids ministry, you know, several times throughout the year, they uh, write, you know, just cards that we send to the kids of our missionaries out on the field or to their families. Um, and, and they write letters, you know, um, so involving them in something, uh, you know, individuals who just say, hey, I have, you know, maybe I have some disposable income or I have means of giving. I could donate to our care packages or I could um, be responsible for my small group. You know, we, we have an email list that we want to receive updates and um, pray for people, whatever it looks like, um, you know, whatever you have to give. But I think once people get that kind of tangible involvement, like you just have a different level of ownership and, you know, and the other thing I want to say, too, is that I think as churches, of course, we send people and and they are sent, you know, they're no longer here at City Church. Mm-hmm. Um, and we want them to be going and planting their churches and reaching people and establishing themselves in their new areas. But I really do think that to be really effective as a sending church, like you also it, this isn't fun, but like you have to live as if like now part of you is in that place. You know, it's like we we lost people when we sent them, you know, mm-hmm. and and but we we celebrate that we commission that because that's what the Lord has called um, us to do. But but at the same time, you know, if I think about that, a little piece of me is actually in Berlin because that's where the Stewart family is. I'm going to be a lot more connected than if I just say my friends, the Stewarts decided, you know, to move to Berlin and that's awesome. And, you know, we'll, we'll stay in touch a few times a year, but otherwise I'm not really going to think about it. Like what kind of light, that's not Christian community, you know, Mm -hmm. or if we're, um, if we're, you know, really walking with each other through this and if we're really saying like, we're going to be, um, you know, a a church that, that comes alongside you and prays for you and supports you, then like we're in it for the long haul. And that's going to demand our time and our resources and our energy and we want that because that that's what true partnership looks like. And so I think if you really can have that mindset of, you know, that just sort of 
probably like if your kid goes to college it's like you're kind of sort of like always in the back of your mind that there's somewhere else that you're not you know and so you're you're staying connected you're thinking about it um I think if we can take that approach to missionaries that um that that we just regularly stay engaged I I like that thought that last comparison you made because I don't have kids in college yet um, only four, only only five years away, <laughs> which is crazy. But that's not not far away. Yeah, but I would think that parents who have kids in college, I would think they, they those kids are on their mind every single day. Yeah, like they think they don't go a day without thinking about them. And in our world we're in today, I'm I'm guessing they don't go a day without texting them or or, yeah. or mm-hmm. something. But the, at the bare minimum, they're they're definitely thinking about them every day. Right. And for us, believing the true family, ultimate family, is the spiritual family. Yeah, that's that's a really that's a really cool comparison. And, mm-hmm. and, and another thing I want to make sure we're, we're clear on too is that we have to fund this. Like we have to fund mm-hmm. the Great Commission. I know we've all t- touched on a little bit talking about Lottie Moon and things like that, but you're talking about you know seashells, not picking up seashells and that kind of thing. Well, for the person that maybe their their retirement is they play golf every day, you know those type of things. Great. I would hope your church gets more of your resources than your country club. Mm. You know, I would hope your church gets more of your resources than Florida State boosters. Not that it's bad to get the Florida State boosters right. or to be in a country club. Sure. But that, I think those things are great. But I, I would hope that the, your church gets, because when you're a, a denominational work like we are, which means not that we're like every other Baptist church, but that we partner with Baptist churches mm-hmm. to send the gospel around the world, every dollar you give, like, it's, like that, 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 that is going to mission mission here in Tallahassee, right? And then mission around the world. Mm-hmm. You know, our missions budget, you know, we have a line item for global and for international, mm-hmm. but our missions budget is our entire budget. Like what we're doing as a church, like we're, the mission has a church <laughs> and, that, and that's what we're doing, what we're carrying out. So that's just so critical. Like we yeah. have to fund this to go around the world. So when we have 70 missionaries at the SBC or, or we go to Richmond for a send off ceremony, like even the, even the missionaries we don't know from other churches, we're still funding that. Yeah. Like we're a part of that. Right. And also nothing unites you like missions. When we're in that room for that moment, you know, Christians fight about everything nowadays, right? Nobody's fighting at that moment. Everybody's no. on the same page. Everybody's praying together. And you'll hear people say things like, okay, this is why I stay yeah. SBC. Mm-hmm. All the other crazy crap and the things that are embarrassing and the things you got to apologize for and all those kind of things like this right here, like yeah. this is why yeah. uh, for what we are able to do cooperatively to take the gospel around the world, to church, to plant churches, to train pastors, all of those things, disaster relief. I mean, different ways that we can have a sending component to, to what we do. So I think it's so important. Yeah, I think, Dean, you, you really kind of nailed the nailed the nail on the head. Is that hit the nail on the head? The um, <laughs> I never actually <laughs> hammered a nail, so I wouldn't know. <laughs> You'd have hit your thumb. Yeah. Um, but uh, it, it is with the idea that re- like you, you may not go. Right, like everybody may not go, and probably won't go. More, more will not go than they than than do go. Oh, by a mile, you know. But everybody has a role in in sending, and so I mean, I think that's kind of what, you know, really yeah, what you're saying by funding. Like, and and so I think the Corporately question as a church family, yeah, yeah, the question that that the church has to ask is, and and individuals have to ask is, how am I sending? Like, if I'm not going, how am I? How am I? fueling with resources, with prayer, um, with, you know, uh, support infrastructure systems, all of those things. Like maybe, you know, um, you know, there's a family who was in our church for a, a long time that was really passionate about international missions. They supported international missionaries like crazy. They have great fl- friendships and relationships. Um, and they were passionate about seeing other people go and put as much time, energy, and effort as they could into seeing that go. They're actively involved in sending and seeing the mission of God go to the ends of the earth. Yeah, they called themselves senders. Yes. How cool is that? Which I love. I know yeah. exactly what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. And so there's ways that even though they're not going, that people can ask the question, what can I do with my time, my energy, my finances, uh, my influence to see people go, even if for whatever reason I can't go. Um, one of the things, Dean, that, that you touched on in that sermon, and if uh, I'd really encourage people to go listen to that, you know, really the whole, the whole series, but that, that last week, you know, it was, um, right around the time, the time that we, pre- you preached that sermon was right around the time that, uh, FSU began. And there were parents in the room that day 
And I think one of the things that you touched on was the barrier oftentimes that that parents can be um, to seeing people go and to be sent. So I'd love for you to talk about that, maybe talk to parents specifically. And then I'd also love to hear from from all of us. Are there other things that we identify as barriers that I don't I don't want to say people just need to get over. But but is there times where like there are things that we do that frustrate the mission of God. If I'm not that we're that powerful, but you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, well, the American dream gets in the way, you know, and our, and especially when it's really dictated by our, by people's parents that had their own dreams for their, for their kids. And I just have, I've heard JD Greer say it before that the biggest hindrance to their church sending is parents of college students uh, who, when they try to encourage people to go two years overseas after they graduate, it's just two years. I mean, it's by, so by the time you're 24, I mean, you're able to start your career, you're going to grad school, whatever it might be. Or you can do that while you're going. <laughs> you can go mm-hmm. for that purpose. That parents are the biggest barrier. So, so I because they just don't want them to go. And it's not even a safety thing. It's more like a life thing. And let's get started. You can be in your career. And, and my just appeal to parents that day is they're dropping their kids off, and our services are still online because of the because uh, of COVID. So I looked right in. The, uh, we have both live and online. So I looked right in the camera and I said, if you if you co- parents are at home watching, you know, where your college student goes to church, making sure we're not crazy. We kind of are. Here's what we're saying. What if your ambition for your child, for your son or daughter, was the Great Commission? Like, like that, that should be normal Christian thinking. But that's mm-hmm. like radical. It's like, it's like what David says about radical. He says that what we call radical, the New Testament just calls Christian. Mm-hmm. You know, like that, that, that that would be the drive. And I hope that's true of me as my kids, you know, grow up and get older is that our, you know, I know it's easier said than done. But like, I, but that doesn't mean I ignore it. It means I really check myself, check my idols. And that our our ambition is the Great Commission. So even my kids don't make as much money as I think they should, or take an opportunity that you know doesn't make sense for their career path they majored in, or whatever it might be. I would hope that what, what excites Christy and I more than anything together as their parents is that they're making decisions in their life based on where they can be most available for the mission of God and useful. That's good. Yeah, I would say. I mean, in terms of barriers, um, I was thinking about as you guys were talking about. The, um, this couple that was in our church um, who are, are like committed senders, sending people to the field. I would say that so often we just think our own, like, um, I think we can be barriers to ourselves, like <laughs> our, our own limitations and like our willingness to kind of settle for um, assuming that we're not called, you know, to, to global missions or something like that. And, and of course not, um, not every person is or, or not every person chooses to go. But I think what is cool when I think about that couple is they they didn't just like first decide on being committed senders. Like, you know, we're just like, here's a buffet of all the ways that I can be involved in global missions and here's the one I choose. Like they were also open to going. You know, they mm-hmm. they gave that like the the time and the prayer and the consideration to say, okay, back to the blank check idea and that's something that we all that's something we all should do is like lord my my life is not my own here here is my life it is a blank check you write in what what it's supposed to be and so i think that more people probably um while yes i absolutely think that the decision to especially to to go long term i mean you know none of us have, have gone through that process but while i definitely think that should involve a lot of prayer and training and like affirmation from other people in your church you know like you there should be other things besides you just deciding you want to do that Mm -hmm. um in your life but i think that probably more people um close themselves off to that than than are open to that um I, i think there's a lot of people who you know, um, could could go maybe not even as like a full time vocational missionary, but choose to take a job overseas or choose to, you know, we've talked about a college student, choose to give two years after graduation to the mission field, things like that, that we just sort of automatically say, well, because there's these other ways to support, I'm like, that makes more sense in, in my life. And, and mm-hmm. so I, I do think that that can be a barrier sometimes, too, where we we have to just be open with our lives and say, Lord, whatever it is that you have for me, like I'm, I'm willing to say yes, you know, and, and sort of see where that leads. Um, and, and, uh, just, you know, have, have that openness and willingness to go. Yeah, no, that's good. I I think one of the things that you were touching on and I was thinking about as you were talking was like, I think there's a temptation to think that going or or even being involved in in global missions is for this maybe more spiritual class of believers, you know. And the reality is it's 
it's not, you know, it's, it's for all of us. And there are ways that, you know, maybe it's not going through the IMB's process and going, but maybe it's, it's being, uh, you know, taking a job out of college in London to go support a church plant and, mm-hmm. and to, to be on that team and to work in insurance or sports or mm-hmm. media or whatever. And, and it doesn't make sense. It's not the, the, you know, Dean, you talked about, it's not the, the, the right choice in the American dream perspective, but it's two years when you're 22 years old and you've got, you know, seemingly your entire life in front of you and to say, you know what, I'm going to think of the mission of God as more important than whether or not I start climbing the ladder right now. Or yeah, it's like, you don't have to be, I mean, it, it's not super spiritual to take a job in London. It, it might be spiritual to take a job in London for the sake of advancing the, the cause of the gospel. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, you know, it, it's not, it's not crazy. Like you're, you know, you're being, you're doing the same thing. You're just saying, I'm going to go to London instead of Nashville, which we need people who love Jesus in Nashville too. Um, but it, you know, it's just that idea that it, it's not for this special class. Maybe you're not cut out for the bush in Africa. Um, I know I'm not, um, you know, or at least I really feel like I'm not, I'll, I'll live, you know, a blank check life, but Lord, please don't. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> well, the first person will tell you that that they're not more spiritual than you are missionaries themselves yeah yes. they'll be the first people to tell yeah. you that yeah. yeah and so i think that's i think that's a barrier the other thing that and i've noticed this with i mean i just think of craig and jen who you know when they went to berlin that was uh, of the couples we've sent that the, the two that i walked most closely with um and just the depth of that process and the and i'm thankful that the process is as intentional as it is even if it might be frustratingly slow at times um they, they, they're very concerned about the spiritual health of the people that they're sending. Um, and, you know, I've talked to college students who have expressed a, a desire at some point to, yeah, maybe I'd be open to, to going to the field. And the thing that I would, I would just challenge people that are maybe considering that is to, to watch over your soul, to take care of your heart, um, because it's hard enough to live the Christian life when you're connected to a great church you know, with people that you love, family and friends and, 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 you know, great church community, like then you're picking that up and, and, and being put somewhere around the world with probably no family that close by and thank God for technology and all those things. But like, if you're not resting in Jesus, you know, that it's going to crumble quickly. Hours of time difference for communication standpoint. And yeah, yeah. you know, oh yeah. And while they're not more spiritual, than the next person they are heroes to us oh absolutely. i mean they, I mean, they really are i mean they're a gospel heroes to me you know what they're willing to do and what they're willing to sign up for and to give their lives to to me is just it's just incredible yeah and we, we, we celebrate them on purpose mm-hmm. you guys have any uh we're gonna bring this to a close but any final thoughts on, on sending i was just gonna say that i you know so often we especially and i say we like us here in like the american church we you know, I think sometimes we can forget that it's like we're not just talking about, well, we're not talking about sending people out in, in their own strength and their own capacity. You know, this isn't like we send you out because you're a really high capacity person with great energy and a great personality. It's like we send you out because the Holy Spirit goes with you, you mm-hmm. know, like Christ is living in you. And so um, when that is what we're talking about is, you know, is taking the gospel to the nations. And so, um, when people go, they go in the power of Christ who raised, you know, who, who raised them. And so um, I just think that's something that can be encouraging that, um, you know, and it can be, gosh, probably really daunting too to know, okay, I'm, I'm going into this community and like, I'm the light, you know, like I'm, I'm the salt here <laughs> um, that I can't imagine like the weight of that. Uh, and so I think, again, that's why churches, we should always come alongside people no matter where they're going just to kind of like hold up their arms in that. Um, but I also think, too, that that we can always remember that, that whether it's that you're going to class or you're going across the world, like you're going with Christ. And, mm-hmm. and so um, just remembering that, that uh, that that's the power in which we are sent. And so, you know, ultimately, like the Lord is going to call people to himself. Uh, but um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think if we just live with the mindset that, you know, it's like, I, I just think about like all the things, all the other things I could give my attention or my money or my time to or whatever. It's like one day, like all this is just going to be like dust. <laughs> it's going to be nothing <laughs> literally. And yeah. so 
what you know the things that are eternal are the things yeah. that are going to remain and so let's give our lives to those things and um, that's much easier said than done but i think that is the call on our lives yeah my, my mini helmets are not going to heaven with me i mean that's <laughs> yeah like, for real i like, guess for real moths yeah. and rust destroy yeah, yeah, yeah. which is sad but, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> the gospel's only good news if it gets there on time yeah right i mean I, that, that's such a true quote and uh my question really just my closing thought is just kind of who's next yeah right like who's next yeah old bill goldberg quote from back in wcw days who, monday nitro who's next 140 you know? wins or something yeah like, who's next yeah um that's that's great yeah i think you know this is a very helpful conversation as we frame what it means to to send and to be sending and i know we focused in this conversation more a little bit on um you know international and global sending um if you you know have more questions about what it looks like to Think about just evangelism and mission in the context maybe locally for you. I'd encourage you to, uh, I think it's episode 12 where we talked about apathy and evangelism. And then uh, episode one, we talked about mission in the context of, uh, you know, of a COVID world. And so there's some some kind of kind of continued dialogue on this topic and we just encourage you to check out those episodes of the podcast as well if you haven't. Um, as we transition into our last segment of Local on Tap, we are, by the time this releases, I think only three three or two days from college football go. beginning. Um, <laughs> like, real least, co- like real college football, not Central Arkansas yes, versus Austin Peay. Yes. Yeah. No offense, Austin Peay. Yeah. But, um, no, thank you. Um, yeah, real college football. So uh, you know, given that we are in Tallahassee and there is a major state university with a, you know, I don't know, you could say historic football program, um, what is, or who rather, is your favorite Florida State Seminole? Doesn't have to be a great player, just – your favorite Florida State Seminole. And as a Kane fan, this is probably going to pain you to, well, to answer. And this, but And this Kane fan would argue that FAMU is more historical and has more national championships. Side note, shout out to producer <laughs> Jacob and his school. Yeah, not untrue. <laughs> Who, you go first. I'm going to go Warwick Dunn. Oh, that was going to be mine. Um, Dang it. Yeah, sorry. Uh, Warwick Dunn, I mean, he just, like, that, as, as a kid growing up, um, watched him, enjoyed watching him play, liked him. He seems, by all accounts, like, humanly speaking seems to be a very good guy so we don't go work as, done as 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 we know any sports references that i make are going to be like you know 2005 or earlier like it's not going to be any unless time. it's the olympics or gymnastics yeah unless it's yeah that's a different story well you did say sports sorry that's you know. oh, oh. Yeah. So <laughs> go. I'm sorry who wore the american flag speedo do i need to bring no. that back up again hey i'm a hockey fan okay whatever i'm just kidding it was it was too easy I'm soccer sorry. on skates good gracious yeah, so i was definitely not going to be naming anybody recent at all um although actually i will since you said work done i was going to say that because growing up i remember like my parents just go, like my parents both were like super into FSU football and so I was probably more terrified as a kid because they were both like screaming at the TV and stuff like that and so I was gonna say work done because that just stands out in my mind from that era um I will also say Devonte Freeman okay. because Ooh. that's that's a more recent yes. uh more recent mention yeah. my one of my very best friends was his like academic coach or tutor or what like you know support or whatever it is academic for academic support specialist yeah something like that and so she always talked about how he was like great and she loved getting to you know know him oops and um and all that so nice. I'll cool. say good NFL yeah. player too yeah. yeah yeah I'm gonna get made fun of from some friends when they hear this but um I'm gonna say Danny Cannell okay uh, not just because I love him on Twitter I think he's hilarious but like when I was a kid I actually did like Danny Cannell and we had just moved from Fort Lauderdale when he signed okay like a year later so yeah. we knew who he was back in Fort Lauderdale he went to Westminster Academy which is actually where my wife went I didn't know her I, I didn't know her then but but our family was very connected at the school he went to knew a lot of people so like we always knew Danny Cannell and then when he was like moving in we like actually went and met him like at Burt cool. Reynolds Hall oh, nice. so he was actually I think kind of an underrated college quarterback he was yeah. very good yeah. uh, someone go Danny Cannell and I'll definitely get made fun of by some people for that but yeah that's 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 home goal. how much grief is your brother going to give you for that choice? Uh, well, Joe Labrador will destroy me <laughs> but uh, that's all right Danny Cannell stick um, sticking with it hey it, it was just for that season um anywho it's been a great episode of the local dive we hope it's been helpful share it with your friends and uh we'll see you next week for another episode take care go Canes Thanks for listening to The Local Dive, a podcast diving into the deep and shallow musings about Christ, the church, and culture. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts. You can follow The Local Dive on social media and continue the conversation with us on Instagram and Twitter at The Local Dive Podcast.